You know, before I jump into the scripture reading, I just got to say this. For singing a new song for the first time, y'all did pretty well. It was a joy to hear. (laughs) Now, our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, uh, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Uh, If you notice by our white vestments, it's not all just for communion, but we are still in the Easter season. So this is a these next four Sundays are an Easter, uh, post-Easter series, uh, teaching series. And it's based out of Matthew 28, 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake... For an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. So they go quickly and tell the disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There, it is there that you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. So here we are in May. But I'm going to focus a little bit on March. When I was out during the month of March, there was someone who was obviously not from this country. I could tell by their accent. And they looked at the people that they were sitting with and said, what is this March madness? Don't laugh. Have you ever been to a foreign country and have no clue what's going on? Have you ever been in your own country and had no clue what's going on? Watch the humility. For sports fans, they know that this refers to the college basketball tur- tournament that concludes with the competition all with competition that happens all over the country. It is a frenzy of people rooting for their favorite teams, only to be met with victory or defeat. And depending on the victory or defeat, the people that are rooting for their team will act and react accordingly. While I was in my undergrad studies in Kansas, my buddy and I traveled from our little town to a sports establishment in a suburb of Kansas City known as Olathe, and we came to watch a game and get some dinner. Now, I don't remember who was playing, but I do remember that the crowd in that establishment were very evenly divided. Of course, one side won, the other side lost. And in that moment, madness broke out because fists started flying. And what resulted is that the police were called. Now, I am very thankful that my buddies and I did not get hurt. I am very thankful that we just picked up our food and walked out the door. But I'll be very honest, I simply do not understand that kind of violence that can erupt from watching a college basketball game. Equally so, I do not understand the violence that took place in Baltimore, Maryland, Ferguson, Missouri, Oakland, California, or Washington, D.C. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't understand the need to stand up for one's rights when one feels oppressed, but to stand up and hate someone enough to do harm to them because they disagree with you, 
That I simply do not get. It does not compute. No matter how many times I have tried to unravel the human condition, I just don't get it. In Matthew 26, verse 52, when Jesus was being arrested, Peter drew his sword and did harmful damage to a soldier from Jerusalem. And as that madness ensued, Jesus chastised Peter for his actions, telling him to put his sword away. For those who take and live by the sword will buy, die by the sword. To transliterate to today's actions, and our lifestyles. For those who believe that violence, evil, and anger are the only ways to deal with the things in life and situations of this world that anger us, violence, evil, and anger will consume our life and take it. If we look at the world of news over the past year, the idea of March of Madness could also describe the violence that continues to play, take place throughout our world in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again, I don't get it. I wish that the elimination of a particular school in the final four of a basketball tournament would be the extent of tragedy of March Madness, but there is so much real tragedy and violence in this world... Sometimes I don't see how the madness can be stopped. What in the name of our loving God is happening around us these days? So much of it is happening in God's name, and so much of it is wrong, violent, evil, and turned into becoming political. Instead of drawing us closer to God's grace, it is these actions that polarize us as a nation and as a people of faith and as a member of this nice little marble revolving around the sun. And if that's true, if that polarization is taking place, that separation, that division, that mode that puts us into a form of self-isolation, then how is it that we as a people of faith can gather on a Sunday morning and feel a sense of great profound joy of this post-Easter season as one nation under God? Maybe it's just a religious form of March Madness. But there are times I wonder... And I dare to ask the questions, both privately and openly, how much of our Christian faith is really driven by the calling of the Spirit, the blood of our Lord Jesus, the gift of God's grace? Or is our Christian faith driven by the convenience of fitting church, worship, service, sharing, and growing in a relationship with God and each other to the various compartments that we generate in our lives? We have a box to stuff it in. But then I am reminded of three words, comprised of only nine letters. The power of these words has no stronger meaning, no stronger influence, no stronger application to our lives as a people of God. And it is these three words, these nine letters, that can overcome and serve as a means of saving us, binding us together, and helping us to be a people who live and share the saving grace of our loving God. Would you like to know what they are? He is risen. Oh, thank you very big. He is risen. He is risen this is the foundational basis of our good news as a people of God and community of faith. This becomes the source of our joy. This is what we must understand in how it changes us first, makes us a better people with a more gracious heart and serving spirit, all because we gather together in the name of the risen Lord and say, He is risen. This is the reality that we celebrated on Easter Sunday. 
but it should never be contained to only Easter Sunday. It should penetrate to soften our hearts. It should fill us to open our eyes. It should liven us to, so we recognize that our footsteps are lighter because the burden of our sins, the things that we feel guilty for doing, the pain we carry that others have inflicted upon us, does not have to weigh us down or slow us down because our Lord has risen. This is an incredibly profound reality, hallmark, tenant, cornerstone that is based out of Easter. Have you ever wondered why? I know I have. The resurrection is a profound revelation because it affects the totality of God's creation. It is not this independent event that God just dropped in. It has been part of his plan since the beginning of his creating the heavens and the earth. Whoa. That can be quite mind-blowing when you sit, sit and think about it. God created the world. He created the heavens. He created the planets, the birds, and the beasts, as well as humanity. And some have wondered, I have read the articles and the blog postings, did God create everything and just merely walk away, allowing a whole bunch of bad stuff to happen to good people? Is God even attending to our world and its problems today? Or is God a, an absent God who phones it in and votes with an absentee ballot with an unknown forwarding address? Or is God like a lot of us, experiencing his creation? Sometimes as an obstacle course to be completed, a hurdle at a time, watching and waiting only for the right moment to make the proper preparations? Or is it that God stays up, up late, late at night, figuring out how to initiate and how to respond to all of the complex actions, feelings, and prayers associated with the turmoil of our lives, our nation, and this world? The answer to these questions is that with the re resurrection of Jesus, the Easter event, it makes it very clear that God is a sovereign. As Americans, we have difficulty time not only coming to terms with that definition, but how it impacts people's lives. A sovereign, which means he is a God who is always with us. He transcends the tyranny of Chronological time has chosen to labor with us and for us throughout the history of creation. If you stop and think about it, God is a God who makes himself available to work shoulder and to shoulder with his creation. That includes us. He doesn't send it off to do the work and just watches us by sitting on a bale of straw. He's there pushing the earth with us, wrapping the bandages, preparing the food, caring for those who are in need. The Easter reality is this revelation that God created salvation on the day that the tomb was opened. That is with the resurrection of his son, Jesus the Christ. The definitive revelation in which God has given to us the good news to know that there is life after death, and then that life overcomes the madness of this world, the madness of our minds, the madness of our hearts, the madness that spews out of our mouths when we are overwhelmed. And why is all of this so important to stop and take notice of? There are a lot of fantastic narratives floating around in video form and in movies about how God works. But we as believers, as followers, as people who hunger to understand, need to be able to distinguish between that which is Hollywood fiction and that which is truly revealed by God.
We need to make sure that the people we care about in this world, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our friends, our neighbors, we need to understand that this is the greatest story to know. This is the greatest reality to embrace. And this is the greatest gift to celebrate. At this past Easter time, I was hanging out with my son and a bunch of his friends. I'd say more than half of them don't have a church life whatsoever. They either fall into the category of the unchurched, or they fall into households that will one day become the rechurched. That is, people who were born and raised but left and will come back one day. So we're sitting there hanging out. I think we were sitting at a McDonald's or something, having Cokes and fries and just kind of shooting the breeze. And I spend a lot of my time just kind of listening, just kind of watching the interaction. I have to perversely admit I enjoy watching my son make them kind of wrap around his finger and then do things that they shouldn't do. That shouldn't be something I should be proud of, but I kind of am. Sorry, it's a confession. And they were talking about looking forward to spring break, which started... Uh, the Thursday before Good Friday, so Monday, Thursday. And they were kind of talking. There became a lull in the conversation. So I asked, do you know about the person who entered the city gates in a triumphant fashion, you know, with the donkey? Uh, And they kind of sat there and looked at each other for a minute, and one of them went, do you mean the movie Shrek, one of the Shrek movies? (laughs) No, I didn't laugh at that moment. But I went on to say, no, I'm talking about that otherworldly one that heals others, hid from the authorities, came back to life from death, and finally ascended into the heavens. And one of the other kids kind of sat there, and I could tell that he was thinking. Because, I mean, he had the creases on his head, and the vein was starting to pop out. And I was about to say something, and my boy kind of puts my hand on my arm, and he says, This will be good, Dad. (laughs) He was also telling me in code that he has no clue what he's about to say. And he didn't, because he looked at me and said, do you mean that really old movie, E.T., the extraterrestrial that had the really bad special effects? As a people of God, why don't we try and stop using all the good fictional stories or quotes from secular authors as a means to communicate our faith, to communicate and, con- and convey the good news that we feel because our Lord was risen from the grave. Why don't we make room to embrace and live the greatest story ever told, the story that is not only true but also expresses a fundamental truth about fra- faith, that God raised the crucified dead Jesus from the grave. All four of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, agree on this point, that the tomb of Jesus was found empty. And our faith was founded on the conviction that not only that that tomb was empty, but that God was the one who raised Jesus from the dead, and in doing so, created a way for all of us to be saved from the madness of this world, the craziness of our households, the unconventional ways of our workplaces, and whatever else is kind of swirling around inside of us that just doesn't make any sense. Karl Barth, the father of what was known as neo-orthodoxy theology, which would take too long to explain, basically said that Jesus is God's yes to humanity. I want, you to, I want to say to you this morning that the resurrection is God's nevertheless yes to us, his human creation. It is the ultimate victory of life over debt, puts the struggles of this world into perspective. It's momentary. It's finite. It's measured, but we will spend eternity in paradise. 
Now, I don't want to discount the pain and the sour and the sadness and the tragedy of the human condition. Instead, I will embrace and share the joy of the resurrection, affirming the importance of it in my life by showing others that the barriers that seem so permanent and oppressive in their human daily drama will someday be eliminated. We will all know eternity. We went through the last century with two world wars. The stockpiling with the capability of weapons that could destroy the entire planet many times over. We have witnessed massive destructions of buildings, villages, cities, and parts of nations. With science and technology, we can now synthesize DNA and generate life. We can make imitation hamburger in a Petri dish. But it has no flavor. We can make life, but we struggle to make life safe. We can make weapons for defensive purposes, but we cannot overcome the simple madness of anger, jealousy, hatred, and sin. Yet in all of this madness, it is the resurrection that assures us that even when things look very bleak, God does not abandon us. Instead, he swoops in and saves us. Through Jesus' life, through Jesus' death, through Jesus' resurrection, God, in effect, is sending us a testimonial to remind us that God may not have looked forward to sending his son to his death, but because of that garden experience there, the arrest, the trial, God knew what suffering, agony, and death upon the cross would be like. Yes, a nevertheless yes to us. God is saying, nevertheless, of whatever's going on, I'm saying yes to you, my child, because I love you, to you, to me. And on this post-Easter Sunday, I encourage you that as we go from this place, after we take the elements of communion, sing our concluding songs, that we go forth celebrating our confidence in God's good news. Let that be our confidence that God is God in the heavens above, and by his love, he continues to create and provide for our future. Because not only that he sent his son to this earth, but that his son was resurrected from the finality of death in a locked tomb. It was at that moment, it was at that moment recorded in the scriptures that God created a means for all of us, created in his image, to be saved from the lives of madness we participate in each and every day. Would you all pray with me, please? Yes, loving God, we will see many things in this world when we leave the safety and the confines of this house, of this room. But allow us to see you. Allow us to feel you pulsating with every beat of our hearts. Allow our actions the way that we will order our lunches, go about our errands, go to our places of work, visit with our friends, have a joy that just flows in and through us to share with the world. We ask this and celebrate this as we continue to remember and embrace the gift you gave us in your Son, Jesus, our risen Savior. We ask this all in your precious and holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.